Welcome to Split the Defense. Where Jordan Webster, Ted Evans, and Craig Pierce talk about the NHL and all things hockey. Split the Defense. Can be found wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. It's also broadcasted on Amherst Island Radio, 101.3 FM, and online at cjai.ca. What up, what up? Welcome to Split the Defense Hockey Podcast. Your hosts, Craig Pierce, Ted Evans, and I'm Jordan Webster. Why don't we talk some fucking hockey here on this Thursday pod, boys? Yeah. Because on Thursdays when we record, for you Friday listeners, we get to swear. Yeah, because we're and not on Amazon good, Island Radio. it's a good goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. All right, we're not going to start there because you know what I'm thinking about. Why don't Why don't we start with the abs? A little, a little calmer, a little more love, mm-hmm. a little more wins, a little more peace in the franchise, a little less drama, maybe. Yeah. We had some line changes. Yeah. So they had the regular, as we had before, Lackin and McKinnon, Rantanen, and then Tufty was in the yeah. top six along with Joe Hansen and Nachushkin. That's new. Yeah. Scratched was a whole list of players, and this wasn't scratched, I guess. This would have been line rushes, and they wouldn't know who's going to play. So you had Drouin, Cogliano, Tatar, Olafson and McDermott all in gray. So we didn't know who was going to play before the game. And Kill McCarr was not practicing. Right. Wow. So ooh, there is drama. Yeah, there was some slide. drama that day. It was kind of uh, things were up in the air. Uh, Avs Twitter, you know, hockey, Avs Twitter. We're, we were all going crazy. Like everyone was like, what is going to happen? Who's playing where? And Kill McCarr is not practicing. Yeah. Yeah. But that all changed really quickly. Kale McCarr did end up practicing. He was on the ice for morning skate. And Huge he was sense of relief. Power play colors. So yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, the first thing that I actually want to get into, um, the, speaking of the power play, is that the Avs run a 3D power play. And Riley Tufty was subbing in on that 3D power play to make it a 2D power play, which the Leafs run. Um, but they have three, and in that, uh, sorry, let me just find it here. They have Taze, Byram, Gerard, Colton, and Nachushkin as the second power play. So first I want to ask, CP, is that weird? That is the weirdest thing I've ever seen on a power play. I don't know if, is that like a first ever? Like, because I've never heard, I like the 2D these days is not very common. So to go 3D, and they are three, like, really offensive defenseman um so maybe it is the best choice um but yeah it's it's a weird one for sure yeah it's uh, something we were doing last year too and um it's just yeah it's a cool way uh, to get a different deployment for those guys uh when you have such a uh, depth uh defense you know such depth on the defensive core uh, like the avs do you can do stuff like that and uh, i mean it had it had paid off a lot for them uh last year uh, a little bit and uh we're seeing it work out again this year if they're uh, Bednar Bednar's liking it. I like that style. Do you do I mean, like if that just... style? Yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's a good way to see the guys uh, out there uh because when you've got two power play units uh and you're, you know, normally like we say guys are doing the 1D thing where they've got a forward back on defense like someone like McKinnon on the first uh power play unit where he's back there and then McCarr. So they're running 1D. The next unit, it's like, we've got all these great defensemen. What are we, why are they on the bench? What are we doing? Um, and sometimes, sometimes, like, you know, some of your best skaters, your best players you are so your defensemen. How yeah. can you do that to your team when you have so much D? That's right. You can't hold back the D. <laughs> <laughs> uh. um, anyways, uh, do you not find it wild that there's three defensemen that are strong enough offensively that they can play on the power play, but not so one way offensively skilled that they're considered offensive defensemen and not good in their own end. These are strong two way defensemen or just two way defensemen with strong offensive play. Am I right there? You're a hundred percent right. And, and I think this is a, 
I think Bednar uses this as a bit of an outlet for these guys like Gerard and Byram, who you see them jump up on plays. And I've said this about Sammy G so many times over the years. I go, Sammy, 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 you're not Kale McCarr. Like, you know, I know you see him out there doing that, and you're like, oh, so defensemen on this team, we can just go do that. Like, no, 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 Kale McCarr can go do that. And these guys can every now and then, they do. But to, to make them do that less in five-on-five, five, they give them this other outlet to, you know, try that on the power play when we are one extra guy. Um, throw them out there, you do you that pull run. that crap here. You do not pull that crap five-on-five. Five. <laughs> yeah. That's We're right. not Kale McCarr. Kale McCarr ended up playing. He got two assists in the game against the Blues. Um, yeah. Must be nice to just win, 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 like the Boston Bruins and the, sorry, so we're not talking about the Leafs, the, uh, the Colorado Avalanche. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is nice. There was s- some wildness going, though. Uh, who ended up playing uh, was not Tatar and Jure, so we had McDermott yeah. in, we had Olofsson in, Cogliano got in. Um, but Tatar and Jure both sat. Um, Tatar, he was asked about it, and he said he wasn't upset about the healthy scratch, but is ready to respond. He quote, I mean, we lost two games in a row for nothing. So it's perfectly normal to make a change or try something else. And Jared Bednar said he scratched Jonathan Drew and Thomas Tatar because he wanted to give Curtis McDermott and Riley Tufty a chance to play. He says, I believe in all those guys. And I think we'll get to where we want to be. It's just, I've got to keep everybody involved. Yeah, it's such a Bednar thing. Um, he's so diplomatic, but that is right because we do like those guys. And if we just had Tufty and McDermott barely playing and down on the Eagles and doing whatever else they're doing and not getting them involved, then it's like where does the confidence go for them, uh, for the team? You know. Uh, but what I really want to know is: you know. is do you think it was more because of the four nothing loss or the back to back shutouts? Um, or do you think it was because of what Bednar said? Do you think he's telling the truth? It's a good mix. I think a good mix. A little from column A, a little from column B. 4 nothing, two games in a row. Something had to be changed. Uh, I think Tatar was correct in saying that, and I'm glad he didn't have hard feelings about it because, I mean, he's a new addition. They've had him up on the second line. They've had him on that third line, and things just haven't been working out. I don't know if he has a goal as an av yet. So, I mean, he would have been a guy to scratch in my books to just try something out. Yeah, fair. Well, Riley Tufty didn't uh, score, but he actually ended up playing against the Blues, and he had four shots on goal. Uh, Ultimately, he was sent back down to the Colorado Eagles with Caleb Jones after Wednesday's contest, though. So that's the end of Riley Tufty. Go play in the AHL. We'll call you when we need you. He's doing Um, great down there, too. I think he's leading the Eagles. So it's it's, it's weird just like... Is he sending a message to Drew Ann and Tatar? It's kind of a weird place to send a message, really. Right? Like, I mean, those are guys you just brought in, kind of fringe players. Like, uh, I mean, they both could be impact players, but they both could be impact players is the key word there, right? Could. They're not guaranteed. Um, If either one of them makes a burst, awesome. If they don't, well, I think they're decently cheap, both of them. So, um, yeah. I just think that uh, it's weird that you would bring up Tufty and play him instead of those guys after the 4 nothing loss, after the back-to-back shutouts, and then go ahead and say, well, I just want a tough to play, and then send him back to the AHL where he could play. Why couldn't he just play in the AHL the whole time? Yeah. Right? I, yeah. I think because they didn't have many more options to, to change things up as they needed to. Duren's been moved a million places. The so next, it was like a, the a next change move for was the, the press box. Change. Yeah, change for the sake of change, but they had lost. And and to the point where, you know, they've got these new guys like Tatar and and guys like McDermott who they want to give time to because he's a guy that was there when they won the Cup uh, and he's around the team. He's he's an av, so we want to get him involved. Uh, but there are uh, – Tufty falls into that, that new guy kind of role too. He did really well in preseason. He's lighting it up for the Eagles. It was like, why not now? Give him, You know, why not, I think is the thing, um, is why try this shake-up. Yeah, is why is why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so we had uh, Ivan Prosvetov play in that game against the Blues, and he picked up his first Colorado win. Do you think the Avs should lighten Georgiev's load this year? Do you think they even could with 
Prozvetov, what you've seen from him and what they have in uh, Noonan, and Frankie's not coming back anytime soon. Um, do you think George um, going to have to play 60, 65 games again? I think he will. I just I, That's just my prediction. I just think he will uh, do that. Do you think he that. should? He, I think he should, yeah. I think he's... Yeah. Yeah, he's he's That's lit right up move. for it. He's ready to go. He got forty wins last season. Let's let's put up another notch. You know, let's do it. Go sure, more. He did, he did prove he can do it. Absolutely right. You can't say yeah. that he can't. He does yeah. have the track record of doing it and doing it well. So he had a great. But can it happen again? Year. I don't know. I hope so. But yeah, I I don't think as good as that win was for Prozvetov, um, and as cool, calm as he looks as a backup. I don't trust him as much as I trusted Frankie and nothing against him, but Frankie to me is like, you know, when he's not injured was the perfect backup. Georgie Frankie to me was so solid. I slept so easy thinking that that was going to be our tandem going into the year. And then uh, things changed. Uh, Georgie said, you know, put it on my shoulders and we did. Um, and we're going to do that. Um, <laughs> We we love Georgie, so well, hopefully Prozvetov, yeah, can provide a little support, but I don't think he'll take much off the load. He had a great yeah. quote after the game, Ivan Prozvetov. He said, uh, I, I, Peter Baugh tweeted this, I'm not sure who he told, but he said, the crowd here, it's really loud. I'm used to playing in smaller buildings, so it definitely pumps your energy up. <laughs> <laughs> That's wicked. That's hilarious. So the, yeah. the kid's getting a taste of the show. Um, so from just watching that game... Do you think he's uh, more of a viable backup than what you have in a Noonan? Yeah, yeah, I do. It's I've got this level thing, right? Frankie, when he's healthy, is the best backup. Uh, this Prozvetov guy is proving better than what we had in a Noonan, who I was not trusting. He had one or two good preseason games. Uh, we had Arvid Holm, I think his name was, play a game. Uh, he's looking awful down uh, for the Eagles. Um, a Noonan's playing great for the Eagles. Um so I think everyone's kind of found their spot for right now with Frankie gone. We've got Georgie holding down the, the lion's share of the games. Prozvetov, maybe a bit of support here and there. Hopefully pick up a couple wins like he's already picked up one. And, uh, yeah, let the guys uh, do their thing down with the Eagles. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Ross Colton, Miko Rantanen, Arturi Lekanen, and Bowen Byram all had goals. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta love, love that. Getting goals from people that you were hoping for were like Ross Colton. That was his first not empty net goal. Bo <laughs> yeah. Byram, who was struggling earlier in the year. I mean, Miko Rantanen's a steady horse, like an actual horse or like a, a moose. A moose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but, uh, and Lex, who's just been on fire, like former Montreal Canadian that knocked out the Leafs in, I mean, I don't know if his, I think Brendan Gallagher's goals the game seven winning but i'll never forget lacking and i was like oh he's a player like he's yeah. i knew he was a defensive player and then he made that play I was like, he's a player and then he goes yeah. to colorado and now all of a sudden he's just like the actual shit so yeah top that's line nice like, to see isn't it oh it's great yeah, yeah for, I'm i think it. that series too is a bit of a showcase for lacking and, and then the next season is when he got traded right so uh, i think that that was a big part of his you know improvement and getting the chance in colorado for sure, he won that contract uh, with his play in that series and uh, those playoffs. Came into Colorado, did the same thing. Had uh, the lucky stick, lucky good stick, lucky, and uh, it was great. We love him. Up all night to get lucky. <laughs> Up all night to get lucky. So the Avs got uh, back on track. They got the four-one win against St. Louis after being shut out in back-to-back contests. Yeah, I'm happy. That's over. It's Do you over. think that's the only time? <laughs> This season, they will get shut out in back-to-back contests. Oh, I, you know what? Do you think if it you could happen again? The, it, I guess it could because I wouldn't have expected it to. I would have said, no, well, it's not that I would have said it wouldn't happen all season. I'm, I'm not about to make a call like that. But I wouldn't, I mean, this early in the season, we were rolling, I think, 5-0 and before it happened. And then we went two games in a row, no goals, 4 nothing, 4 nothing. So I guess it could happen again. But wasn't already, it like years yeah. since the last time that this happened? We went out yeah, of this last episode. Like and like, so I, I feel like it's not going to happen again this year. Maybe another yeah. shutout for sure, but not back not to back. Not two in a row, back right? Back. Yeah. yeah. No. I know. Yeah, that's what yeah, I was thinking Ted was, was going to say. I was surprised. surprised. But you know what? You, you, that's a very good answer because you're right. I didn't expect it now. So how can right. I say that I can't expect yeah. it again? 
So yeah, I, I know that this team is capable of getting shut out back to back twice. I wasn't sure about that the last few years because it didn't happen. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, they seemed so elite this year. I still feel like that, but uh, obviously we've seen this. They needed that shakeup uh, in the lines because they got shut out twice in a row. So it happened. <laughs> it happened. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's flip over to the Leafs. Yeah, so let's go back to Tuesday's game against L.A. That was obviously a tough one to watch for Leafs fans. Uh, the game ended with a convincing 4-1 L.A. win. The first burning question, who would you rather? Bertuzzi at $5.5 million or more at $4.2 million? All jokes aside, uh, did either of you accept, uh, expect Trevor Moore to be the player he is today when he was a Leaf? CP, what do you think? I don't think any of us did, and including Kyle Dubas, obviously. It, it's a, it's one of those, like, the Leafs have had a few of them. I'm not sure any of them really were their own fault because just there wasn't room in the lineup to give guys a chance. We're running into that problem again, probably, with guys like Nick Robertson, where Webby thinks that he's going to score 40 goals somewhere else. Um, but it, I, it's it's just one of those things better. where if there's no spot in the lineup, sometimes you just take the value when you can. Um, I definitely wouldn't prefer him over Wasn't Bertuzzi. Wasn't he part of the Jake Muzzin trade too? So yeah, yeah, he right. was. Yeah. So, you know, we got some use out of him. Value in that, yeah. Yeah. Trevor Moore, I n- didn't even realize that he played – 52 games or something like that is what we found out the other day yeah uh, and i messaged the group chat and was like what did you expect that nobody expected that no so he was around he was a guy and you know what he was at times an impact type player he did go out there and make an impact but he, he was consistent with it and i think that was the issue like the talent was always there and we saw that he had it it just was can he put it together over an 82 game season Right? Yeah. It's a long season. So, I think that, that we. being said, you, you're right. You have to get the value where you can because at the time, there wasn't really a spot for another young guy that's inconsistent. They needed his spot to try. Well, they thought they did to try and fill for Jake Mazin. That didn't end up working out, but I can't say we lost that trade at the end of the day. Yeah. No, not at all. Jake Mazin was a, our best defend, defensive defender for years. So, um, that was worth it. Yeah, now you got a pro scout. Um, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Right, Poor Jake. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm happy that he's found a spot on the team anyway. You know. Yeah. Um, right. And another guy, Morgan Riley. We gotta, I gotta talk about this on the power play again. The top power play unit, Morgan Riley. Uh, so, what does John Klingberg do exactly, Webby? What? I what don't do- know anymore. Um, <laughs> if he doesn't play on the top power play unit, what does John Klingberg do? Yeah. Why are you here? Like, what is your role? You can't defend. We've seen that. So, like, you're supposed to be the offensive guy. We were supposed to be so convinced that this guy was number one that there's no way Morgan Riley would ever get a glimpse of the top power play unit because that was going to click, right? Always going to hit. Well, that didn't fucking happen. No. What are we, like a month, six weeks into the fucking season? (laughs) John Klingberg. What a terrible fucking signing. Sorry. (laughs) I mean, he's back on the power play. (laughs) We'll say that. But he... Yeah, uh, he played there to play the uh, Bruins game. Yeah. Um, I... That was just like a shakeup. You know, it wasn't necessarily because John Klingberg was the issue on the power play. The whole team was absolutely brutal. Um, I was so upset from until the end of the second period. And then basically I just gave up and decided my emotions were better put somewhere else. But um, well, Klingberg okay, wasn't but- the problem. They just shook it up. This is he's also playing way too high in the lineup at the moment. Um, that he should is never way- be an option. CP. You sh- that the if. Klingberg's role is you can't play defense, and we understand that. You are our top offensive defenseman. The top move should never be taking John Klingberg off the top power play. It should be taking Mitch Marner off the top power play or somebody no else. 
Not a chance. That's the Why, craziest John Clayton, thing I've ever heard. If you heard. want to shake it up, you're talking shake things up, right? Oh, let's make a minor, minute move that's barely going to change anything. That doesn't do anything. Take somebody of actual substance out and put somebody else in. See what happens then. That's a shakeup. If John Klingberg is convincingly this offensive defenseman on the team, and that's the reason that he's here, that's the reason he was paid $4.2 million or whatever he makes. If that's why, then he should be never considered an option to remove off that power play unit because without him, that top power play unit would be nothing. That is my point. And that what? is, if he's not here, if he's not doing that, then what else does he do? Because John Klingberg is not useful in any other position. He's a third pairing, maybe power play specialist kind of guy. He is. He needs to be sheltered. He's not, like, you can, I mean, uh, watch so many podcasts. One of these shows said something about, it, it comes down to instincts, right? When you go into a corner, it comes down to instincts. You have no time to think about what's going to happen next. And his instincts are they made a way better comparison, but they're nuts. He makes terrible decisions when he's pressed and he passes the puck out to the other team in the slot. Like, that's. Are you a winger forechecking, passing up to the middle of the ice? Like, he's made some really, really bad gaffes and he's let people skate by him. And I don't know if you've seen him skate back to the zone. But he skates similar to Mark Giordano, and I think Gio's got 10 years on him. <laughs> not good. Not good. So if you're not on the top power play unit, John Klingberg, why are you here? That is. Yeah, why, I mean, we're having different discussions here. You're talking about how he is in his own zone, and like the question is about the power play. And I'm sorry, but he's not stapled well, there forever. I don't care who he is. That's where the question is. comes from. Yeah, that's where but the question I don't... comes from. So if he's not doing that, then do you not think maybe the John Klingberg signing was a mistake? Yeah, we're the, again, we're having different qu conversations. Like, yeah, yeah, I definitely think that it was a mistake. Like, Dumbo would have been a way better choice if you waited two months. Um, and waited two and months, yeah. Klingberg is a defensive liability. It's very clear. But, like, just because of those things, I'm not leaving him on the power play just because the, it's not working. Like, and you're going to take Mitch Marner, who's paid $11 million to – be an offensive well, player. You gonna so take, you're going to take, take him off. Tavares and we have a perfectly good player in Morgan Riley to put there if it's not working. I don't know why you would put Bertuzzi on the power play instead of Marner. Like that seems like to shake things up because that's what you're saying for a shake things up. Why well, that's such a minute mix. I just don't understand what that's a that's it's a small change. You know what I mean? It's what he did before, and that also takes away from sure the power play is really not the discussion so much as John Klingberg's role is supposed to be owning that spot because that's supposed to be the reason that we're convinced or I'm convinced as a Leafs fan that he should be here. He's got a role. That's his job. He's going to set the top unit up. But if he's not doing that, he's the first one to go. He's the first one. Keith says, ah, we need to make a change. I'm going to put Morgan Riley back. Then I mean, it's the, the same question if you're going to cut one of them. I'm cutting Klingberg first. You know, I'm not cutting Marner, Tavares, or Matthews. I'm cutting Klingberg. Like, if I'm sitting someone on the bench, if I'm not t putting someone on the power play, it's going to be yeah, the so one that's the worst on there. And if we go back to him. the original question, CP, it was, what does John Klingberg do here? Uh, nothing. Uh, like, now we're having that. Can, like, that, he, was, he that, that is, was the original question, and I went off. <laughs> all right. Well, okay. So, yeah, he's he makes terrible decisions. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, like, it, yeah, I agree with you other than, like, we. I thought it was that M Morgan Riley got pulled off the power play, or put on the power play, and that shouldn't be it, but... Um, no. Like, yeah, no, no he's been brutal. Like, mul multiple, almost all of the signings this summer have been awful. You know, like, I, like even Bertuzzi's on the fourth line now. You know, Domi's the only one that's kind of pulling it together and trying to find a home somewhere. But, yeah, I think all of the signings are bad. I, w I wish John Klingberg wasn't on the team at this point, for sure. Yeah, fair. fair. So, so does this team, guys, um, have it in them? to play playoff-style hockey and win games against strong defensive teams like L.A. Still talking about that Tuesday game. But what do you, what do you think, CP? At the moment, no. <laughs> uh, this is 
even tonight in the first period, I it was the exact or last night for the viewers, it was the exact same thing. So they had yeah. four periods basically of just playing awful like bottom tier hockey. Uh, like it's hard to watch it any other way. Like there's definitely some moments in both games that or in in the LA game that was okay. Um, like Wall played fine, even though that his stats didn't really show it. Um, but like the whole team was, it was, they looked tired. Uh, they looked like they didn't want to be there. Um, there was until like the very last 10 minutes, there was a little bit of pushback, but that's a team that knows that they can take advantage of that. And that's playoff hockey. Uh, they're just like a, a style that shuts you down. They take advantage of the opportunities that are given to them. Um, and that's exactly what succeeds when the games really count. And that's how the Montreal Leafs... went far. That's how Florida went far. Yeah. Both of those teams, I watched them go all the way to the cup final when they weren't supposed to because they capitalized on opportune chances and played good defense. Yeah. And Boston plays that way too. And they almost ran into the same issues. Um, playoff hockey, it's kind of a culture. And LA has been playing that way for a while, um, but they just they weren't just quite the good enough. Yeah, yeah um, but yeah, there seems like they do now. But that's the thing about the Leafs. I find like I my theory is that the Leafs are built to win games three to two. They aren't built to let in a lot of goals. They're going to play defensively, right? But they aren't scoring three goals all the time. That's the problem. They are getting those three goals all the time. Now some nights they do, but in those nights when they get six and seven goals, they're letting in four. Five. So, I mean, you can play run and gun. You can go up and down the ice. They can score that way. And they can play the tight games. The problem is right now is they're having trouble winning those tight games against those strong defensive teams with big defenders. That's always been the Leafs' uh, Achilles heel is big, strong defenders who we think are almost useless, who fantasy hockey we'd never pick up. You know, just those guys... And they shut the Leafs down. They shut those Marner and Matthews and Nylander down. They get into the zone. They can't do nothing. These big, long guys um, that can use their stick that's probably like six and a half feet long. Uh, so now they got their three feet of their arm and their six and a half foot stick and nine foot swat. You can't get within ten feet of this guy. Otherwise, he's going to take the puck from you. You know what I mean? Those big buggers. So... That has always kind of been the Leafs' Achilles heel. Um, I think they can. I think they can play a, a defensive-style game. But they need to find that balance of like not having to, to go and let in four goals to get the seven. Right? If you're, if you're playing and you're getting seven goals, that's great. We love it. But if you're letting in four, that kind of defeats the purpose. So... You know, we love we love 3-2 games if you're winning them, but we don't love 2-2 games where you go to the shootout and you lose in the shootout. Like, we don't like that. I don't, I'm don't. i not a fan of that style of hockey. It was intense and fun um, for against the Bruins, but it's not, it's, it, I don't know, I don't know how much, how much the Leafs have it in them. I don't know how to say that. I don't know how much tenacity the Leafs have in them to actually continue to play that way and learn to play that way f well enough that they can have success to do it in the playoffs because they can do it. We've seen them do it. We've seen them limit other people, seen them limit chances, but they haven't done it and scored as well. If they're going out to score, they're getting scored on. So, like, can they? Yeah. Will they? I don't know. We haven't seen any reason that they would. Yeah. No, it's true. And and again, in the uh, the L.A. game, Tuesday, Toronto only had, uh, talking stats, three high-danger chances. CP, is that good? Is that a good number? Three? No, that's awful. Mm, they had, yeah. Tonight they had three high-danger chances on 10 seconds of a power play. So <laughs> that goes to show you the differences between tonight's game, or last night's game, and Tuesday's game. Yeah. Like, uh, no, three is awful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's three bad. all game, right? Yeah, is <laughs> that good? No, that's know. that's bad. That's yeah. bad. Just so you know, um, and uh, and Domi, he showed some of that snot that Brad Treliving mentioned uh, 
come out at the end of the game against LA. Do we need more of that from Domi, Webby? Is that something you like to see? Uh, so I was saying this earlier, and it came to me as a as a, a epiphany. Nobody will fight Ryan Reeves, right? He's too big. He's <laughs> the heaviest of heavyweights, and he's not really the fleetest of foot, and he's not really defensively great. He's not really oh, – he's another guy. What do you do here? We'll get to that. But I kind of wonder if you need a smaller guy. Like if Michael Bunting fought, he would have been the best leaf. we build statues of Michael Bunting. <laughs> yeah, he can play on the sure. top line and fight. Oh, my God. He's Darcy Tucker. Like, yeah. Like, oh, my God. Like we have one. He's we got one. Yeah. We found one. But <laughs> you can't get Ryan Reeves to do that. You need somebody a little smaller who other teams think they could pick on, maybe. And I think maybe yeah. Max Domi could step into that role because we've seen him throw hands. No, we're not asking him to fight every game. I'm asking him to lead the way in the agitation. We need a rat. Go be a rat. And if they want to fight you, guess what? You're not Michael Bunting. You will fight them. Right? That is what I think we need from Max Domi. Go out there, piss the other team off, and fight them if they want to fight you. Not like Michael Bunting where he skates away and they both go off. Like you're going off anyways for two. You might as well both go off for five. You know? Yeah, for sure. I, I think if he could uh, like take on the identity of like Brad Marchand a little bit. And, you know, because he's a guy that... He doesn't drop the gloves a lot, I mean, no, but, but you yes. definitely know that he's like willing to, right? And that's kind of the difference between him and like someone like Bunting. Um, Bunting just refused to, which was like his downfall. Like you said, we would have built a statue of him if he maybe just had four or five fights. Like that would have, you know, made all the difference. And Domi, I think, is finding his way a little bit. And you saw it at the end of the LA game where. You know, he has that in his game. You know, he likes to skate fast and he likes to get under people's skin. Um, like and we haven't seen that either things, and but it's starting to come up a bit, you know. Liked. Hmm? Nothing. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> and, anyways, um, yeah, I think so too. Uh, I think that if you're going to have anybody do it, might as well be a dummy. Yeah, I mean... Also, like no one's gonna fight Reeves because they want him on the ice. You know, he's easy to play against because no, one, he can't catch anyone really. I haven't seen him throw a huge hit in a few games. Um, so yeah, he he's a guy that you want to be out there. Domi's kind of annoying to play against a little bit because he's a little slippery and he makes good passes. Um, so yeah, you're the other team's more willing to exchange. Plus, he's small, like well, small-ish. Um, so like everyone kind of feels a little more comfortable, but if you're just a little wily, then, you know, and just do it like his dad did. We don't, we're not asking say. him to be quite like that. You know, yeah, that's what you don't want to put that on his shoulders. That guy. But, he's yeah. not that guy. No. He's a completely different player, yeah. but he does have that snot. Right. And he is, he is in that, uh, zone where more people would more likely fight Max Domi over Ryan Reeves. And I mean that sounds 100%. obvious when you say it out loud, but that's the that's my whole case in point is that you need somebody who people think they have an advantage on. Now Justin yeah. Bourne told a story in his uh, his book that he wrote um, about his first fight. He went and picked a small kid, a small stocky kid. He's like, that was a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I should have figured out who didn't fight, but he decided I'm gonna go and, and pick this guy. He's small. I could take him. And no. No, I can't yeah. actually. Hard to move around too. A, t a tall, lanky guy is probably a better choice because they timber like a, a tree. You know, you can at least push them over. But smaller guys, they get inside and tough to fight. So lower center of gravity for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll remember that in the future, boys. You, you giants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. That's right. I know. So CP, I got I got something to uh, to a bone to pick with you here. You're you're claiming Mitch Marner is off to a slow start again, uh, in your words. But yeah. he has eight points in nine games. Uh, is it really that slow? Is what, I mean, what are we Come on. what are we asking of Mitch Marner? Like I I expect him to be a hundred point player, and 
like eight and nine and it's after the Boston game, it's nine and ten. Like we're talking about a seventy five point player, you know, like it's nothing a like that's a guy that points. should be paid six to eight million dollars, not eleven million dollars. You know, it's, yeah, but he's it's not the same do that thing all if, season. It takes like five exactly. games out of the eighty two game season. To, to like four point nights, he's gonna have five out of the eighty two games he's gonna play this season of the nights are gonna be four point nights, five point nights, whatever stupid nights that he has because he has them right three and three points, four points, and you know what? There's gonna be a bunch of nights where he has two points. So if you start adding all those up, he's gonna get there. It's just he's got to continue ticking, keeps going, yeah, keeps at the pace, and then the... he gets a couple more, and then he gets a couple more, and then he plays a couple more games, right? And he gets ahead, he gets ahead. So I I, I think he could. I think it's kind of uh, early to make that call. I think Mitch Marner thinks Mitch Marner's off to a slow start. Like, I don't think it's wrong to say yeah, that. He's CP, right. But, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. he's right. He's he like that guy. Yeah, he's he's right. fucking right. Yeah. No, I he love knows. the guy. He's, he's no, a Mitch guy Marner's that, right. yeah. No, I, I'm just saying, I bet. I, if we were to ask him, he'd probably say, yeah, I wish I was scoring more right now. But do you not think he could still pass the 100 point plateau? I think he could, no problem still, because it doesn't take any. It didn't take any time for him to rack up those. What if he has like a month of like five four point nights or three point nights? Three point nights are easily conceivable for Mitch Marner to have. He has five of them in a month. That's fifteen, and we can take those over. So you know what I mean? Like that's that's a lot of points extra, right? Yeah, ten but... points over. Then then you're up. Now you're nine points over, and. Then you're so then you're looking at 82 as your 91 point player. Then you have another month like that, right? Where you only have to do that a few times, and then he ends up over the 100 point. He's never actually reached the 100 point mark either. That's the that's the whole kicker in all this. Can he? Yeah, well, he definitely. If he started on time, then he definitely would. And yes, he is a nine a hundred. But point hasn't player, he started on time but... before? No, no, never. No, has. no, he's never been a point of point a game player in the first 10 games ever. And like last year he was on a similar pace the year before he had like four points in 10 games. Um, and it's kind of the identity of this team is not starting on time. I don't and it know, comes Matthew down to on time the beginning, with a couple of hat tricks. Yeah. But it, it comes like at the beginning of games, they never start on time at the beginning of playoffs. They never start on time. Mitch Marner doesn't start on time. If you're talking like, it's almost like a reset in the season during playoffs. And if he's in game five and he has three or four points, that's not good enough. And so it's, it's about starting on time, not whether or not he'll make it to the 90 to a hundred. I think he will, but this is about like being like, this is, we need you to be here, you know? And I would love it if he came out like Matthews and, you know, had three or four points in some of the games, but he's only had one, and I think he might have had a two, two goal or a two point game. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's he's a slow starter, and it's kind of the identity of the team to me. Damn. Sorry, love the guy though. <laughs> That's some harsh love. That's some tough, yeah. tough harsh love. Yeah, I just um, want the best for him. He's like a child. <laughs> it's like the teacher in school. They, you know, you're always picking on the ones that you know have more. Yeah, and I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> He's just not reading at the same level as all the other kids. I mean, he'll get there one day. He'll be reading the books like the other kids. He's just not getting there. The thing is, is, it... is he is reading at the level of the other kids. But I want him to be better, and that's the point. Is that Mitch Marner's supposed the thing to is, be? He's not an interested elite until the second chapter of the book. Yes. Yeah. And he's, he's like, like, he's like what a, is this? in the seventy fifth or something ranked in points. Like, you know, just that's not who Mitch Marner is. Yeah, you want better. I hear that. Um, some slow starts, uh, though, and identity of the team. Let me list some players for you: Domi, Nyes, Camp, Minton, Holmberg, Reeves, Gregor. All those players have three goals and eight assists, eight assists combined in these nine games. And now an extra 10th one, probably not much added to that. Um, so what needs to happen to get uh, them going? What do you think, Webby? Well, it's not good. Um, yeah. It's bad. It's uh, it's disappointing to see after we were supposed to get this rejuvenation of Max Domi and Tyler Bertuzzi and, and Matthew Nice as the savior. I mean, I love Matthew Nice, don't get me wrong. 
And nah, he's yeah, playing well on the one on this list. God playing never well. didn't love you. You were always the best. But <laughs> three points. I mean, I think most of those points are from Matthew Nyes. Yeah, I was going to say, he's probably the one guy who has most of those. Yeah, I could have <laughs> taken him out and there probably would have been zero points. So, <laughs> um, yeah. That's not good. And I have absolutely no idea how you're going to fix that without getting rid of some guys. Like, just trade, like what? Trade oh man, out? I don't even know. Just like for trading for a bus, like I don't, <laughs> whatever it takes. Like I don't know. It, I, you, what are you gonna do with them? Like if you don't want them, like you're gonna have to pay to get rid of them. Send them, put them on waivers. Send them to the AHL. If nobody takes them for free, then nobody takes them and they go play in the AHL. Like I don't know, but like, I mean, I mean, these Holmberg's are NHL giving names, a shot. Right? Holmberg's giving a shot. Um, and I mean, to CP's point earlier, uh, it. Is that he doesn't like Camp and uh, this is last show Camp and Nyes and Domi together, right? We talked about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you have Holmberg. You could put him in that spot, and you could try that. But there's also other guys in the AHL that maybe you should be trying if these guys aren't working, just because they have experience, just because, just because. I mean, try it, right? I mean, we're switching. Morgan Riley for John Klingberg here in the power play because things aren't working. And that's supposed yeah. to be set in stone. So this stupid bottom six that you've built, Bradtree Living, bend a little and bring somebody up from the A. Like he said at the beginning of the year that he had a really deep system and he liked it. He liked a lot of his players and what they do. So why not try a few of them? Like just, it's not like I'm asking you to bring up a line of AHL guys. I'm asking you to plug and play one single player for like five or ten games at a time and see if he clicks. That's yep. it. There's a whole bunch of them. Yeah, we did it with Tufty. I mean, try a guy for even one game. Try a guy. Scratch a guy, try a guy. The difference Could is, scratch is that a win. this team needs a centerman. And so, like, you know, it's easy to There's put Tufty under the what wing. About, what about yeah, Abrazitsi or Steves or yeah, you know, yeah. Like and Bobby McMahon think... can center? Yeah, not well. Um, and like Camp in is in the third line center, and I don't think he shouldn't be on the team, but I think he's a great fourth line center, and he's just placed way too high. But he's now, a, if he's you're a think fourth line center on a cup winning team, right? Yeah, like, and we can't find a third line center on, in the AHL. I just don't think that that player is there. And it was maybe nice you if, can. Yeah, maybe, yeah, it's worth trying. I do agree. Try some guys for sure, but I think the in in reality it, it's probably going to come into you're plugging someone in there who doesn't belong. You probably are fighting it until you can go out and find someone on the trade market. True. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean between yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven players having eleven points in nine games like that combined. I think you could probably try somebody and not risk too much. Defensively, though, is where it's a risk because I think a lot a few of, of those players play defensively, right? I think a lot of it is a, well, most of them have hands of stone and can't play in the NHL. That's a lot yeah, of the but reasons, if but if you bring up someone from the AHL, I mean, like they're going to be a liability defensively. Well, that's what I'm saying. I don't know if they will be. I think a lot of hockey players, like they learn defensive systems. They know how to play. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of these guys. They can keep up. They can skate. They can play defensively. They can check. You don't get a lot of impact players who are scorers, right? So if that's what we're getting them to do, then that's great. But that's the, that's the argument that we're making right now, right? Can we find an impact scorer in the AHL? We don't know because we haven't played them up here. Should we try? I think we. I think at this point, with that amount of points between those guys and this amount of games, unless things change, like American Thanksgiving's coming up here, and that's kind of like the line that you draw of where it's going. Like, if you're going to have a good season, you're going to have a bad season. People turn it around. I understand St. Louis in 2019 and all that stuff, but it, it's statistically 88 percent of the teams that are in the playoffs by American Thanksgiving make the playoffs in our in the history of the NHL. So you kind of know where you are by then. Um, that still leaves like three or four teams. I did the math the other day um, out of 32 teams. So that would leave like three or four teams that could flop in or out. Um, so like I don't know if you can find a guy that you can put in there, but I think it's worth trying. 
just going to finish my th- long rant there. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah, definitely worth trying. I agree, buddy. Um, like I said, sc- scratch a guy, try a guy, maybe scratch and win. Um, let's flip over to the Bruins game. Um, that just happened last night. Um, the question before the game, uh, here was the question. Will William Nylander find the score sheet? So Nylander can set a franchise record for longest season opening point streak and would pass Frank Mahovlich, with who, at, who did eight games in a row in 61-62. Lanny McDonald, eight as well in 76-77. And John Anderson, all tied for the same record, eight games in 82-83. He did it. So could Willie do it? Well, yeah. Um, I mean, he did. He did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He so totally congrats, did. Congrats, Willie. Yeah. Um, it's it's a little bit of a, a low bar to to hit, to be honest. The ten games, I'm shocked at that. It that's what it's at. Some some of the other teams have some pretty outrageous records, but um, but good for Willie. It just it shows that he is off to a hot start. This is a contract year, Willie. He's looking like he's yeah, worth I love the ten this. million. I love this. I just have to read this before we get too far into this. CJ stirred the pot here with a little tweet. He said, uh, (laughs) pending UFA William Nylander has a 10-game point streak to start his season for the Leafs. Way to go, CJ. Run the narrative. Yep. So. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's a contract year, and, like, I think that probably has a lot to to do with it. Um, I I don't know. I, I really hope it doesn't. Like, if he gets a big contract... Regardless of whether it's the least or not, I like I want to see him play next year. I want to see how he plays because like right now, William Nylander might be the best hockey player in the world. Like I know that you little guys look at me like oh yeah yeah. When he goes out on the ice, he makes a difference every single shift. Every single shift. He's in the conversation for top five in the NHL this year right now. Who are the top five best players performing right now? I would say my I would say William Nylander is definitely in that conversation because if when he's on the ice you notice him like we had a conversation earlier uh, like you can't I couldn't tell who's on the ice a lot of times because I'm watching plays checking who's open seeing where they should go watching how the defense plays stuff like that and you're like I check every single time who's on the ice which I ended up doing more by the end of the game by the way but. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry. What what was I going on about? I just lost my point. <laughs> Willie's the best player in the league. Oh, but but William Nylander, when he's out there, you notice. There you go. There's the point. You notice yep. he's every single time he's out there. Nobody has to tell you. They don't have to say his name because he's running across the screen and grabbing the puck and skating up the ice with it, making a sweet play. Like his feet are moving. That's something he said at the beginning of the year was that if he wants to be good, his feet have to be moving. And I think it really went to his head because the guy's skating, like skating and skating and skating. So Yeah, he's definitely the best version when he's when his feet are moving. And and he's playing when he's playing fearless. Um because that's he's always had hesitant moments. Um and that's been kind of the biggest complaint from all the uncles out there. Um not willing to go to a corner, not willing to hit anyone. And he's made those changes too. I've seen him go hard into a few corners. Like he had a, like one actually hit tonight. Um, and, you know, I like that from Willie. You know, he's no Elias Pettersson or Jack Hughes. Like there's guys out there that are just, you know, killing it. Um, but uh, yes, he looks like the $10 million that they should have given him during the summer because some other team might be thinking like you are and are willing to dish out 11 or 12 for a guy that's putting on this type of performance. Because you're right, he yeah. controls the game when he's out there. Oh, he does. It's the William Nylander show. Yeah. I yeah. really want him to be playing with Matthews um, because of Marner's super, super slow start. Um, I feel like he... Uh, now it's w- super, super slow. <laughs> it was just slow. Uh, now I'm we've, just it we've on, added it. Yeah. yeah. I see that. Marner. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on my him. fantasy team, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, oh, that's yeah. why you're so salty. That makes <laughs> so much more sense. The salt comes from the fantasy league. You're not even like yeah. normally. You'd be like Marner. No, if he's he was great. Our, no yeah. complaints. Absolutely great player. He'll yeah. find Look it. At this he'll guy. get there. He'll, yeah. he'll be on my yeah. side. But since he's on his fantasy team, he's like horrible. He'll never be a hundred point player. The only reason I know that he's a slow starter is because of fantasy, because I've either had to try and trade for him or try and trade him away in previous years. So 
it's that's the reason that i key on it so well it's just because of fantasy hockey it's why i know so much about hockey to be honest it's just <laughs> fantasy hockey oh, that's uh, hilarious yeah that's great um i've got a couple updates here from david alter that i gotta read uh, to preface this next thing um so he says sheldon keith says that jake mccabe with the groin injury, will not play against the Bruins, and it's unlikely he'll return to the lineup this weekend. He will skate on his own tomorrow. Um, the next one, he said Connor Timmons has been back on the ice, but the Leafs D-man, who had a promising training camp, is a ways away from playing. So now we had this thing uh, in the Bruins game, right? Um, yeah. And the, the, the Lilligren. Injury. Timmy Lilligren is going to be yeah. out. Yeah. So yeah, Friedman said yeah. Uh, Sheldon Keefe says Timothy Lilligren will miss significant time. So his ankle got really messed up on that play. I think um, could have been his knee, but it looked like his ankle was not in the right position when it went into the boards, and then went in a completely different position. So I don't know what it's his lower body injury, um, but. Brad Marchand clearly can open her to him. I didn't see it in real time. Nobody obviously did. How the Leafs didn't respond is a completely different conversation. But yeah. it was a missed call because, like, Brad Marchand 100% can open her to him. Somebody, if they saw, if somebody that was a Leaf saw that and they didn't respond, shame on you. Because yeah. that was a dirty play. Yeah, and that was a little bit where we saw Domi. He gave him a little shot at the end. Klingberg ended up at some point, you know, talking yeah. to him. But it's like such a weak response from when you're – he's such an important player for you right now when McCabe and Timmons are still out. Um, Timmons, like when they asked uh, Sheldon Keefe, he said, like, he's a ways away. Like, it's not even – like – he gave like an expression like he wasn't even close. He might be skating, but um, and so yeah, down another defenseman. Um, yeah, not looking good. No, what do you? What's gonna happen? Like, I mean, I much? guess Simon Benoit is getting called up. I'd assume he's gonna be the guy that gets plugged in here. Uh, luckily, Lagason looked pretty good tonight or last night. Um, so. It, it it's one of the, we were talking about. We wanted to see this is the chance for guys to kind of display if they're ready for the nhl lagason looks like he might be he was good in preseason and now he's had a he didn't play much on tuesday but he had a good game tonight um he was forced into play because of injury again um but i think that um we're gonna see benoit and i know that i was just saying that the leafs needed to trade for a centerman um but Defense is what Brad Trilliving was preaching in the offseason, and he might be kind of have to force his hand to give up a prospect of some sort to uh, bring in some help. Yeah, True. I would uh, I would think that there's got to be something because, like, as you see, it's not that they need somebody if everybody's good in a perfect situation, but if something goes wrong, look where we are now. So I think there's clearly a need at this point for another body. Just another warm NHL body. Doesn't have to be studly stud. Just somebody to be able to play and fill a hole and not be a liability, right? Like Yeah. And I'd like to see them maybe be put on a second pair. Lagason maybe moved up because he looks more reliable than Klingberg uh in his own zone. So I think you just you keep Klingberg on the third pair. Um, maybe even put them in the press box, but um, they don't have the cap um, room to do that, I don't think. so. But, yeah, like they're going to bring people in. Um, it, it, they don't have to do anything special, but just kind of don't be awful, and hopefully until we get some guys back, um, they can hold it together. Hopefully. Uh -huh. um, but... Also, so let's let me talk a little bit about the goaltending too, because this game against the Bruins, um, Sammy started and had 38 saves on 40 shots, uh, helping the Leafs at least make it to the shootout. But uh, he let in the first one, he let in the second one, and the Leafs couldn't score, so they lost 3-2. Uh, any change in your guys' opinions on the goalie situation? Not super drastic change, but Sammy looked great. 
uh, he was the shining light tonight. He made a lot of big saves. Both goalies did. Swayman stood on his head for a big portion of the second period where the game could have been 5-2 for the Leafs. Um, but then at, at definitely at the beginning of the game, the game could have been 4 nothing for, for Boston. Um, at the end of the game, too, there were some scenario, like situations where he really had to um, make some big saves, big lunging saves, and that's what he's good at. Um, is making those big saves. That's kind of that his kind bread of and butter. Thing, yeah, it is one of those things where if he's on, he's great. It just isn't quite as reliable. Um, Wall, you know, he would have made attempts at those saves, but not as much as Forte is making big, sprawling saves. Actually, but the other night he did make a really good stretch. Um, uh, did like the inverted splits, actually, but... Um, yeah, I, if, I'm if a goalie's not, good, should they not have to not make those big saves? I mean, if they can technically move themselves around, should it not look so sloppy and, and, um, like it's just, that's kind of a, what I've always heard, right? That if it's, if it isn't looks it your like fa- it's, isn't it your favorite saying though, that it's like, we're playing vol like vulcanized puck on ice with <laughs> knife shoes you know <laughs> stuff ha- shit happens you know um like it's not always going to be perfect so goalies do have to make even if you're the best goalie in the world what makes them good is be able to be in good position and also make those big sprawling saves because they're bound to happen well i just seen nerds i guess we'll say statisticians um point out that if <laughs> people are in good position oh it's baseball in baseball the outfielders if you're in yep. a good position in the outfield, then you don't have to run and make a diving catch. Kevin Pilar wasn't actually a great outfielder. Right. He was a terribly, he positioned himself terribly. <laughs> he was just really fast and willing to dive for balls, and he caught a lot of them. Yeah, yeah really so athletic. Really, we he thought he was standing amazing. Under it. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of the other guys just positionally know where to stand, and they, they're there. They don't have to. They can run up and stand and catch the ball as it comes underneath them. And that's where you kind of get it the same as goalies, right? Like the more, and I've heard this from the more technical side. Like Joe Wool is quieter. We'll say he's a oh, lot very. quieter than Sammy. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, is it more like he? It's not that he's not capable. It's that maybe he doesn't have to make those saves as often because he's in better position. Right. Yeah, I'd say that applies for ninety-seven percent of shots, maybe less actually, because yeah, a couple times a game, you have no choice, but you're caught off guard in some way puck off of two skates into the lower zone and you know you're just gonna have to make those sometime and hopefully wall in his calm style can also make those big saves and i think he he can um it's just sammy did because that's his his forte um and and he yeah he played really well it's just it's not necessarily after one game gonna totally change my mind on the goalie situation no, eh? No. And what about you, Webby? Is that does it make your mind up, or are you still? Uh... No, I can just say, make this quick. No, no, no. It hasn't changed my mind at all. It's one game. Um, I want to yeah. see. I want to see more from each of them. I I think if anything, it could be a fifty-fifty split, but it's still leaning towards Joe Wool. Um, yeah. And the only reason is is not because Sammy's not good. It's because they a don't have control of him next year. He needs a contract again. B, they need a guy who's going to do it now, like right now. So it yeah. doesn't matter who it is, actually. Like they have no preference. Like the, I don't think the least organization has a preference between Wool or Sammy. And it makes absolutely no difference. It's whoever is playing better. Yep. And Wool right now is having more success. So I think, no, I think Wool is still probably going to be the guy come playoff time. Yeah. And uh, some other potential changes Matthews and Marner finally got going against the Bruins um you know Matthews uh, only has, has uh, two goals outside those uh, Hattie Knights um so do you think Keith splits them up if they can't be consistent quickly what do you think CP I've always been asking for William Nylander to be on on Matthews wing if you look at the expected goals and I know I'm not a big nerd but sometimes I look at them and he's like a 60% without Tavares doesn't have to be with, with Matthews. And he's like a 40 with Tavares. Like, they're just not a good match. So as 
for multiple reasons that Willie's looking good, that Marner's not really clicking, and that I prefer the ma- the pairing of Willie and and Matthews. Um, I think that that's what they should try. And there was a time when Marner was just setting up Tavares for his best career season. Um, and I, I like how those two work together a bit more than Willie and Tavares. Just, they don't click. It's, I'm sure that they like each other, but they just don't get along quite on the ice. It's, it's their styles, I guess. I don't know. Is that fair to say Webby? I think that Matthews and Nylander, uh, would be dynamic. I think that the Leafs actually should load a heavy, top heavy line. Um, I think that they All have three. forces to do it now. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't yeah. you? Just yep. go and own. Just don't let anybody do anything. But the only problem is the drop off after that. So you yeah. have to load it with it like a John Tavares. Hmm. And the second line still has to have some, with like a William Nylander who clearly owns the ice. It doesn't matter who he's on with. So that's where, like, you know, you're starting to wonder who can play. 2C. Is it Willie that plays 2C? Um, I don't know how they switch it up. They had him in the preseason. The whole thing was, oh, Willie's going to play center this year. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so, like, C. don't give me the whole, no, no, you're wrong. That's never going to happen. Just wag your finger at me. Because that's not true. He could. It's very viable because that is what they prep for in the preseason. That was the whole big deal they made of it. So that's what I, was I think if I think that would be the best case scenario is you have a loaded top line. Don't tell me it that can't work. I use it in shell all the time and it works great. Yeah. Okay? We're already talking about, we're looking for a third line center though. And if we're sacrificing our second line center, we don't need one. We have I, William Nylander. He's Problem not a sec, He's not a second line center. I, I sure he is. I'm fine. If they, when they were attempting to have him be on better matchups as a third pairing, but I can't see this where Tavares is up there. Um, I, I do don't hate a super line if if you're doing it with Willie, Matthews, and Marner. Um, but again, it's a big drop off at that point because uh, Tavares can somewhat drive a line, but it's somewhat inconsistent. He needs someone to to play with, really, like everyone. So, and then if you got to your third line, then it would just I think that. I like a more diverse. I would rather see William Nylander drop to a third line to drive his own line than to actually put him up there and just save that for the occasions like, you know, games when you actually are trying to go for it in the third period and you need to shake it up. Yeah. Be nice to and see I don't think it's be nice to see like Domi get some chemistry in somewhere in the top six and be able to drop Willie down to the three and put him with Nyes kind of thing. Willie Nyes. Yeah. Even like camp at that point, you're not really worried about it. Well, somebody has to have a conscience, right? Like, <laughs> you can't be all offense all on the same line all the time. What if you lose the puck? So, yeah, we've never really seen camp and Willie play together. So, I wonder, I, but that's the thing you don't need to. They don't need to. It's not, it's a duo. And at that point, then you have camp there to make sure the puck stays in the zone, uh, stay in front of the net, bang pucks in around the net if you can. But those two guys are going to run the show, right? Because I think William Nylander and Matthew Nyes against third pairing defensemen would just ruin their lives. Like, they would not yeah. be happy with that. I don't even want to play this game anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Those two go out and party, and Camp just kind of stays home and cleans and just gets things, yeah, just ready for the boys when they get back, and you know, sends them the stuff they need sometimes out on the out on the night. Um, I got to talk about this quickly, um, Fraser Minton. So as we know, he was sent down. Uh, Cam Loops Blazers. Now the Blazers have named him the captain. So this says something, doesn't it? Doesn't it, Webby? Yeah, absolutely. Fraser Minton being the captain of the team down there is awesome. Um, like huge, uh, like uh, Stephen told us, Logan St. Coven is no longer around. Um, so yep. Fraser Minton is the guy now, and that's awesome. Hopefully, I, I mean he's a leaf. Why wouldn't he be the captain, right? Like he's the best, <laughs> the best now. Um, he played like what three whole games? Like he touched NHL ice in actual NHL games. That, that I've played actual NHL games, guys. Like relax. So <laughs> yeah, you know, of course I'm your captain. Don't worry, I got you. Um, no, I, but I seriously think it'll be great uh, for him being the captain. Obviously, they have a lot of trust in him, a lot of faith in him. He's going to play, hopefully, every role, so that way he can develop all his skills. Um, power play, PK, get him his minutes how you can, um, and make the guy into who he's going to be. I think he's probably going to be more of a defensive player, but yeah, make him into who he's going to be. 
I have no problem with having a, a really good fourth line replacement in a couple of years for camp. Wouldn't that be awesome? A camp replacement. For sure. I would hope I'm hoping that he might be that third line center that we're looking for next year. The, I don't think he's got the offensive touch, but a third line can be, if it's a shutdown line that plays at against top uh, players, and you that's can't kind have of have that the thing on the least. Him. We've seen that. You've seen that when the top two lines get shut down, the third line gets fucked. So, like, you need an offensive scoring line. I, I think that's pretty much the end. Like, that's it. That's what they're going for now because they've seen when they go. What happens in the playoffs? Is it the defense that doesn't work? No, the defense is usually great in the playoffs. The metrics are great. They don't get scored on a lot. They can't fucking buy a goal. That's the problem. So. It's they need a guy who can who can score to go on that third line play with Nyes and Domi. Those are offensive players, right? Yeah, we're talking next year though. So, like this is a guy who's he's never coming back this year. So, yeah. So you think they do you think the Leafs will end up with a third defensive line again under Brad Tree Living? Well, I think that ideally that he's just a guy that is able to play up there, and that is a bit of the identity of Brad Tree Living is defense. Um, whether it's the pairings or if it's the the team itself. Um, so I wouldn't be shocked if he's not necessarily locked into being a David Camp only defensive those hands for stones. He he can be more than that, I think. And he's a he really intelligent Kerfoot. player. No, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, I mean, that okay. wouldn't be the worst thing. Kerf was okay, an fine. NHL player, so, you know. No yeah. Alex Kerfoot. Yeah, and he did some Abs time legend. with the Avs, so he must be he must be good. Avs legend. Um, All right. Yeah, I think when the Avs weren't very good, though. <laughs> yeah, he was on us on the Avs during one of our worst segments of <laughs> team action. Awesome. Um, and he scored twenty goals, so. Like, yeah, enough, enough to trick there. us into we'll take it. But that's what him. happens, right? Leo Komarov scores twenty goals, and he goes and signs a big contract with the New York Islanders because he scored twenty goals on the Leafs. But nobody scored goals that year. Somebody has to score goals in these games, right? Somebody's yeah. getting the puck on their stick. They're going to get chances. So, yeah, I think Pierre Parento scored twenty that year too. There's two. Goals. Or maybe it was just Leo the one year. I think maybe. Boy, I don't know. I think there was one year where it was just Leo. If I'm being honest. Anyways, enough about the Leafs. Um, we went on about this for a long time, so why don't we get into uh, keepers and sleepers? So, sleepers and keepers. So, um, today I have a sell high, buy low, who to pick up. I, I didn't do a who to drop because it's too early for this, but um, my first on sell high is uh, Frank Vitrano is, has nine goals in, I think, ten games or maybe nine games. Um, the dude just is on fire. Yeah, and he's playing above his numbers, like oh, I think, big time. Yeah, he's a he is a shooter. I will give him credit. He yep. is a guy that he's in a better situation now, and he is going to score this year. So I wouldn't sell him, like get rid of him for too little, um, and maybe try and ride it out. But he's definitely not on this pace. So if someone thinks that he's a nine goal, like he's not an eighty goal player, you know, <laughs> no one is. So. Um, yeah, if you could get him for a guy who's more consistently like a, a point a game player, um, maybe slightly under is where you'd be aiming for. Um, I think that's a good target to try and get for this guy. Someone who you definitely know is going to be reliable for that, right? Um, and two more guys um, that I'll kind of put in together is Brock Besser and William Carlson. Um, they're both at point per game level, um, and both are not point per game players. Um, definitely are, are good players. Uh, and Brock Besser to me is a guy who has a, a higher skill ceiling and he hasn't really found his spot um, in, in the last, well, ever since he's been in Vancouver. Um, and he does kind of have a role now uh, with JT Miller. Um, but he is hot out of the gates. Um, and so I ne wouldn't necessarily think that He's going to keep that up. William Carlson has always been, you know, a 50 to 70 point player. Um, and if you could upgrade a bit on that, he's a guy that you probably are going to have on your team all year. If regardless, he's, he's kind of a good categories guy. Um, and, but he's uh, again, above his, his uh, usual pace. Right. 
For sure. Yeah, yeah he's a guy I have Vegas. on my team. Yeah, he's third line on Vegas right now. Um, he's a guy centering the third line. He's a guy I have on my team. Uh, winning lots of faceoffs, doing well in our league, ranked high. But do I see that sustaining? Yeah, I don't know. I think you make a good point, CP. Yeah. So there you go, yeah. sell high. Chip. What about buy low? <laughs> Who can you yeah, buy low on? Buy low. And this is a weird year for a few players um, that I think that are notorious, at least point a game. They All three of these guys can push for 100 points. Um, Matthew Kachuk last year had 112. I forget Something like now. That. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, he's a guy, he's shockingly starting slow because last year he did come out of the gates really hot. Um, and so Matthew Kachuk to me is the number one guy out of these three. Um, seven points through 10 games or so. Um, definitely well below where he, he's going to be. Yeah, I think that's uh, kind of a name value there, right? <laughs> it's like it's going to be hard yeah. to buy low on that kind of guy. I think that you are definitely going to have to give up something. Like these aren't you're not going to give up any of my sell high candidates to get these players. Um, but I'm thinking on my team if um, like a Steven Stamkos playing way better than Matthew Tuchuk at the moment, but I would give up Stamkos in a heartbeat. And if someone's looking at the, I don't know the exact numbers, but the 13 or 15 points that Stamkos has, they might, it's twice as much as Tuchuk, still a name value guy. But, um, you know, I know that Tuchuk at the end of the year and is going to be a much better player and a safer player health wise. Right. Okay. Um, Jason yeah. Robertson is at that seven points as well. Uh, very slow start. Yeah. And Kirill Kaprizov, even though he has nine points, still well below where I think that he'll end up at the end of the year. Yeah, these are guys, if uh, if you're not buying low, if you have them on your team, I would suggest holding on to. Don't, uh, like, like I've got Matthew Kachuk, and mm. it, I sometimes I'll read comments, and people are, oh, should I drop this guy? Should, and it's like, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Don't get rid of Matthew Kachuk. Um because, yeah, people could be buying low off you with this yeah. guy because he's going to go big for sure. That's a guy that I, I would definitely, if he wasn't on your team, Ted, I would definitely be targeting him. Cause, um, but as you said, like, hold on because, yeah. Like, yeah, there's no doubt that he's going to turn it around. Yep. I think there was a few um, honorable mentions you had there too. Yeah, like defensemen are a little harder to read because they're mm, not typically point-per-game players, right? Um, and you'll be more likely that the person who has these guys on their team will hold because they look out there and there's not a ton of defensemen unless they're Cal McCarr. Um, that's really lighting it up, right? I know. Um, I have one of these names. Who are do they? you? Which one is on your team? Miro Heiskanen. Ah, yes. Miro Heiskanen, four points. Um, well below where I think he's going to be. Um, but... I, I wouldn't necessarily, like, if I'm new, don't lose hope because he's the guy, right? Like, who else on Dallas is going to take power play one from him, right? Not John Riley. Klingberg anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely yeah. not. He's expendable. He can be traded out for Morgan Riley at a moment's notice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and... Uh... And Roman Yossi. But if Morgan yeah. Riley was on Dallas, he wouldn't be taking over the top power play from Miro Heiskanen. Is that what you're telling me? Are you proving my point from earlier right now, Greg? <laughs> I, I don't think I said that, so no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Would he? You said, you said who if else they is needed the a there? big shakeup, a really large shakeup, then I would That's do it. That's a really large you know? shakeup. Yeah. Is that a really large shakeup on the Leafs? John Klingberg to Morgan Ryan. I mean, if it was the opposite, I'm definitely putting Heisken in on the Leafs power play. But, um, yeah, and Roman Yossi, um, who uh, has six points, who's like above point. Like I try and keep defensemen over 0.5 per game, points per game, because they do get your hits and blocks a little more than forwards do. Um, and he's just slightly over that, but Roman Yossi is a, you know, I consider him the second best fantasy hockey player. Uh, defenseman, sorry. Defenseman, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. and what about pickups? 
Yeah, so pickups, I'll kind of just name these off quick. In our league, actually, I think. Uh, You've had all four of these guys on and off your team. These yes, are streamables for you. Yeah, so they're my stream go-tos, but it's tough with a couple of them that they might be turning into guys uh, that I would have wanted to hold on to. Um, and Mason McTavish is a guy who left my team and now is on someone else's team in our league. And I don't think he's going to drop him because he's, uh, I think, five or six points in the last four games, just lighting the lamp in Anaheim where there's not many guys there and they're all kind of playing well, but he's leading the way in my mind. And I think that, yeah, he's he's probably the least likely to be available. Um, he's already at 68% owned. Um, but then Casey Middlestad is second line center. He's kind of doing doing well. Nick Suzuki is a first line center, uh, top power play. No one's ever taking that spot, and every first and the line centerman. Canadians aren't bad. Yeah, they've been playing well. Uh, every first line centerman should be on a fancy team, you know. So when you see him there, it, it doesn't. Other than seem Matty right. Beneers, because he's I had him. Awful I dropped right him. Now. Yeah, <laughs> Beneers or, yeah. or Suzuki. S- S- you're ta- you were talking Suzuki. I was talking. I Benier, had sorry. Suzuki. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Beneers is awfully. You tried to trade him to me. I was like, no, 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 I'll just take the one guy. You can have both of these guys for that. Yeah, just you the can one keep guy. the trash. Beneers. Beneers. Drop Beneers. Yeah, yeah, yeah and then I was just that. like, yeah, I I knew at that point. I, said, I don't want your him. trash either. One for one, good deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyways, I had uh, Nick Suzuki, and I right. dropped him. Uh, I have other better centers, but he's just he doesn't have enough peripherals. If that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, if that's mm-hmm. the word we're going to use, he yeah. he does. If he's not putting up points, uh, he doesn't win a ton of faceoffs, or he hasn't won a ton of faceoffs. Um, and I mean, like he might be in the six, seven, eight, even ten night so range sometimes. But there's like I have faceoff winning guys like uh, like I had Sean Couturier. He's good for like ten to fifteen a night faceoff. Yeah. Wins, right. Unless he's playing a really good team, and that's the kind of like a John Tavares. He's good except for tonight. Or Boston, he got smoked. Uh, they had uh, the Leafs were only thirty three percent in the face off dot as a team. Yeah, everyone got smoked team. tonight. So yeah, everybody got smoked. But um, anyways, those are the kind of guys that you want to keep. So he face off wins wasn't good enough, and he really needs to pick it up. Like for fantasy owners, if if you know, we want to take him, otherwise it's like, I mean, he's a great hockey player, skilled hockey player, but he's not. I don't know how much you really want to pick him up unless there's nobody else left and you need a center for some face-off wins because he will fill that for you and then you have a chance of getting a goal or an assist. Um, but he's not going to go out and put up three blocks or hits or uh, he doesn't shoot the goal, push, shoot the puck on goal six times a night. He passes it to Cole Caulfield who does that, right? So, Yeah. In my mind, I always think about it like how many teams are there and how many centermen can you have on your team? And so we have 12 players in our league. You can you can have four centermen on your team and be able to fit them into your roster. So that's 48 centermen. And I just, it's hard. I always think about where they're sitting in the lineup. What kind of opportunities will they get? And he, if Montreal can't be, you know, garbage this year, then I think that he'll have a better season than we've seen from him before. And once we're talking about power plays and his point numbers going up, I think the th- things that you're talking about, Jordan, will be uh, less important if he's racking up power play points and things like that. But I, he still, I th- even though I'm telling him to pick them up, but he probably will end up being a guy that just floats. He'll probably might be on every team this this season, right? Like yeah, just float in between yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah, good streamable for sure. Yeah, if if you got the spot for him, yeah. And you got one more on defense, too. Another good pickup. Yeah. I hope I don't butcher this name, but Pavel Michikov. Um, Michikov. He's Anaheim. Yeah. He's Anaheim's rookie defenseman. Um, yeah. Just lighting it up. I'm not sure how long it's going to last for, but ride it while taught. I'm going to have him on my team until he drops off. And he does provide a lot of hits and blocks as well. So. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good for the Cats League. Really trending upwards uh, as far as ownership and uh, and his position in and, you know where he sits in our league, so definitely yeah. a good pickup. Had him on my watch list for the last couple of days mm-hmm. before you grabbed him. Yeah. Also in a points league too, like he he is even though he is kind of a category spiller, I would he's pushing to be on a, a points league team as well. True. Yeah. Huh. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, CP. That was sleepers and keepers, keepers and sleepers. 
Sleepers and keepers. What do you guys like? What do you like, listener? Should tell yeah, us. Let us Comment. know. Let us know. Is it sleepers and keepers or keepers and sleepers? We'll pick one eventually here. Till then, we're going to butcher <laughs> and just go back and forth. Anyways, I got some France news. Um, they made a trade. And I think Ted is probably better to explain this than me. They traded for one Jacob Komiak uh, yeah. to the Sudbury Wolves. They received the Sudbury Wolves received a second round pick in 2027, a fourth round pick in 2025, and a sixth round pick in 2027. Who is Jacob Chromiak? So Jacob Chromiak is the younger brother of Martin Chromiak, um, who's now in the LA uh, Kings system, playing for the Ontario Reign. Um, when he was with the Frontenacs, um, I mean, he was a guy. He was our import player for, I guess it would have been 21 or 2021 20, or 21, 22. I think those were the two years he played with us. And he was always right up there in the top uh, handful of uh, scorers on the team, right around Shane Wright, uh, Lucas Edmonds, um, guys like that. Martin Kromiak was a name. Uh, if you have ever listened to the, uh, the broadcast or watched the games, his name was all over the place. Um, so Martin Kromiak, uh, fun to watch. And now we got another Chromiak in Kingston. It's uh, fun to see. I think that was a lot of part of the trade of why we wanted him here, was to uh, keep that family kind of uh, connected with Kingston. Yeah, that makes sense. Martin actually plays uh, for the LA Kings system and for the Ontario Reign. Yeah. In the AHL. So he played there last year. He's playing there this year still. So he could play for That's the what LA I, Kings yeah. and come up and beat the Leafs. It's good stuff. <laughs> Um, it's actually Jacob's birthday, so happy birthday, Jacob. Yay! Happy birthday. Um, one of the nice. biggest accomplishments that I've ever seen in my short time paying attention to all this stuff is a broadcaster calling 3,000 games. And when the Barry Colts visit the Kingston Frontenacs on November 3rd, the game will represent a milestone moment for this Kingston icon. When the puck drops, Jim Gilchrist will be calling his 3,000th. Gilchrist. Jim Gilchrist. Gilchrist. Sorry, Christian. (laughs) Uh, Jim Gilchrist. He's going to call his 3,000th OHL game. That's just amazing for somebody to be doing something for that long and not be replaced. Um, Now, obviously, he's, he's... done this in multiple places. I, I, I don't know if he's just done 3,000 at uh, Kingston Frontenac's games. I would think that spans over his career. But 3,000 games, still being there, still being on the mic and calling games, that's a hell of an accomplishment. And good for you. Yeah, Jim. he's uh, yeah he's the play-by-play guy. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with Jim uh, when I used to do uh, the Kingston Frontenac's games with uh, Fresh Radio and 96.3. I would do the uh, out of town scores and produce uh, the live uh, segments for like you know we used to broadcast the games. Jim was the play by play guy, and him and I were uh, on on mic and uh, a call with each other throughout the whole game. So I was listening to him. He'd pass back to me in studio, and uh, amazing guy to work with. Total professional. Um, obviously, yeah, tons of experience. Um, amazing guy. Yeah. Congrats, Jim. Congrats, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. It's- Fucking awesome. Good for you. All right, so that's our France news. Why don't we jump into north of the blue line? What do we have there, CP? Yeah, so we got a special question from a special person who's actually a big fan of the show, and he's my father. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Great guy. Thanks, I Dad. love him so much. and Love you too, Mom. And uh, <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Yeah, so he texted me, and he says, how do I ask a question on the show. <clears throat> and so obviously I told him, I said, but you could just text me like if you want. And so he just texted me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was his question. Which Canadian team makes the first trade? And I wanted to get your opinions first. Just just quick answer. He, you know, I... I think that there's two obvious ones, but what do you guys think? Can I say the two obvious ones? Yeah. Well, can I, one can of I them just guess before you just throw you? Yeah, Toronto and Calgary, right? That uh, makes sense, right? Is that yeah. them, the two obvious ones, or is it is it maybe both the ones out west? I don't know. I think those are the two that make the most sense right now. Yeah. 
Ted? Yeah, I was thinking um, – my mind went to Edmonton first um, and maybe try and figure out a goaltending situation. They need to do something. Thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's where my men went first. But uh, what were you – did he – was there more to that, or what were the two obvious ones that you thought, CP? So to me, it was clearly that it was going to be either Calgary or Edmonton. Um, okay. I think Calgary, for yeah. totally different reasons, um, Edmonton's a team that has no choice but to go for it. Um, they have yeah. Connor McDavid. Every year with Connor McDavid is a go for it year, and if you don't, he's probably going to leave. Didn't um, Ken Holland yep. explicitly say, though, like he said it into a mic, you can't go for it every year? Or you yeah, can't buy but every uh, year or something like that. Uh, was that like I maybe I'm butchering the quote, but you know, know the that, context. You remember yeah. what I said. You remember what he said, right? You can't go for it every year or something. Like yeah, he was something that. like that. When you have Connor McDavid, yes, you yeah, absolutely you can. do. You have yeah. to. Yeah. Like, do you want him to stay in town? Because that's the most important. That's thing. not even the point. Do you want to waste this prescient moment that you have with Connor McDavid, the best player in the league for his time in the league? No. Go yeah, out and do just, everything you can historic. to win his team a Stanley Cup. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And then Calgary. I mean, what that that's a team that it was bad last year and but when you look at the roster, they have a lot of good players, a good yeah. a lot of names, I guess you should, you would say. Um but just are far from putting it together. And I think they're not going for it. It's just how early are they going to start selling off their team? Um and I think either Edmonton or Toronto might be able to get involved there because one Canadian team's losses is another one's gains. Um, and I think, what do you, do you guys think that Calgary is going to, you know, call it early or do you think it, this, they're just going to be awful until the trade deadline? No, they're, they're going to start doing things like things are already, they're already stopping this and doing that. And players are saying shit. So, yeah. um, I think they really got to get things moving now and not wait or people like fans are going to just keep booing and or not showing up. Yeah. I think it's in the flames best interest to wait <laughs> because Ooh. they don't, they aren't going to be better this year. They're not going for it this year. They're not like Edmonton. They're not desperate to unload some bad players and get some good ones, right? They can hang on to these players. And if you want them now, the price is high. The price goes down by trade deadline, but we're hanging on to them until the last moment, till everybody wants these guys, right? So right. Calgary, so as an organization, bidding. they have no reason to give these players away early. That just helps the other teams. Why would you do that? So they're going to hang on to them unless teams want to pay an astronomical price, especially like in Edmonton, like in the same division and all that. Like they're, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, maybe Toronto, but even then, Toronto's going to have to pay an early fee price. Then they're going to probably have to pay a Brad Trey Living price. Yeah. Right? So you're going to have taxes on both of those, right? Uh, I'm just, I, I think that it probably makes sense. It probably doesn't. I think if if I can take what both of you said, and and I think that this means that Edmonton is probably going to be the first team it's just not with Calgary. It's going to be with another, probably an American team. Somebody else. Or maybe uh, like Montreal, possibly. Um, and they, I think, are going to be the first team to make the move is Edmonton. Montreal is playing really well. What if Montreal thinks they can make the playoffs this year? They might not sell at all. It's, it's true, actually. With their start, if they kept it up, like another 10 games of being good, yeah, you're probably right. They might not sell. But... There's teams like Anaheim and, you know, like, Very true. I, I don't want to list San all the Jose. bad teams. Yeah, but, um, yeah, there's a lot of teams out there that if you're going to pay a little bit more, which I think Edmonton, if they're starting to look a bit better, but, um, yeah, they they might find a trade partner first out of the group. Yeah, I, I mean, if I was playing in uh, Edmonton, I wouldn't mind moving to California. That'd be, that'd be a nice, <laughs> yeah. nice little warm move around this time of year, especially. Yeah. And actually, yeah. one that I I didn't write down and just coming to me now um, is Vancouver. Um, even though they're playing well, they clearly have issues on defense. Um, so I think it's a very clear spot they're trying to fill. So I'm not sure they'll jump to you know overpay because things are going well. 
but they are a team that's actively looking for a player. Yeah, so I think we kind of figured it out it's going to be Edmonton. Edmonton is yeah. going to be the first one to make a trade. Toronto Think, wants yeah. one. Um, Calgary is in a position to make one. Um, Vancouver probably needs one, but they're playing well. Um, Edmonton is desperate beyond desperate. So mm-hmm. yeah. there you go, Dad. For That's sure. probably what's going to happen. Thanks for the yeah. question. That was pretty awesome. That was north of the blue line, courtesy of Craig's father. What's your dad's name, Craig? Howard Pierce. Howard. No. HP. Thanks, Howard. HP. Yeah, yeah HP. thanks, HP. <laughs> <laughs> HP. Right on. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> thanks. Um, so we're going to just run quickly through what the puck is happening around the league, and I don't want to talk too much about the story of Adam Johnson because we all have heard it by this point. If you're listening to this right now and you haven't heard the story of Adam Johnson, you need to go and listen to other hockey podcasts. We are not the best. We are just trying. To we're do not our breaking best. that for sure. Yeah, yeah no. We're reacting we're to these stories, right? We are. <laughs> we are the, yes. not the top. We're not releasing. We are. We're going to talk about it after. So here's the aftermath. Um, I'm going to just say that the Adam Johnson. He was an NHL player, and he was 29 years old. He died on live TV after another player in the IHL slashed his throat with a skate. Uh, regardless of how you view the avoidable tragedy that happened to Adam Johnson, how does the hockey world ensure this doesn't happen again? Do neck guards need to be mandatory, like helmets? Everybody thought that was probably crazy back, but does it need to be mandatory from youth up? Everybody needs to have one. NHL, it doesn't matter. Um, Many teams are taking the stance. The WHL was the first one to do so. They announced mandatory neck guard protection. For immediate release, it says, the Western Hockey League announced today the adoption of mandatory neck guard protection for all players effective Friday, November 3rd, or as soon as the protective equipment is available to the clubs. That's the important line there. As soon as the protective equipment is available to the clubs. So if they don't have them by November 3rd, you're kind of like, we're waiting. It's now considered backward, and we're waiting. Um, All WHL players will be required to wear protective neck guard equipment at all times while participating in on-ice activities, including WHL games and practices. The WHL anticipates challenges in delivery of protective neck guard equipment from licensed suppliers due to increased demand following the tragic passing of Adam Johnson. Yeah. So they're giving time. Um, they're not going to enforce it too hard right away, but they are making it mandatory. It is going to be a thing in the WHL. In the NHL, we have Pittsburgh Penguins players leading the way. Uh, Pedersen, Carlson, Eller, and Graves all wore neck protection sleeves for the Penguins. Rasmus Dahlin had one on. There was several other players who were wearing I think TJ Oshie had one on. Um, people are taking the stance that this is it this isn't a social cause guys this is like oh shit i could die yeah Yeah, no i'll put that on like yeah that's that's a good idea so do you guys think that it should be mandatory that from here on out there shouldn't be any more hockey these nhl guys should all have to wear them it's like a freaking turtleneck it's it's tough to say um is it's a really tough question because i think it if guys want to wear one, it's the same thing with like a visor or the things that aren't quite mandatory right now. Um, like, like, like a, you know, like a cage. Like younger players having to wear a cage. The sixteen-year-olds in the in the tournament. Um, why doesn't everyone have to wear a cage? Uh, you know, you could you could really but take it's like it that more, this far. This is more like a seatbelt because we don't want to clean your guts off the road. Why do I have to wear a seatbelt? Why do I get charged if I don't wear a seatbelt? Yeah. If I go through the windshield, then that's fine with me. Because we don't want yeah. to clean your ass off the road. That's disgusting. And we got to clean your rack up. So, like, no, I do, wear your seatbelt. It's just better for everybody. Yeah. No, honestly, right? I'm all, so, I'm that's all the for whole thing. the... Uh... Like, you don't want to see yeah. this tragedy. This shouldn't happen in this game. For our game's sake, you have to wear it. It's like a helmet, right? Yeah. And that's what you're, you're... You're literally sound like the guys, probably, in whenever the helmets were implemented, that's saying, well, I feel like if the guys want to wear a helmet, then they should be allowed to wear a helmet. But I think the well, guys no, I'm want all, to wear I'm a helmet. I'm all for the neck guard. Yeah. No, you're you're definitely missing my point or didn't hear me or whatever, but I'm all for the neck guard. Um, it's just the fact that is it going to be mandatory right away? No. That's not how this shit works. That's not how the NHL and shit works. No, it's um, not. It's, it's, how long it's do just you think not. before it should be mandatory? How long do you think you should give them? 
Um, it should be one of those things, the way helmets came in, where some guys are grandfathered. If you're older and you're this late and you've been in the league this long, you have the option. Uh, if guys who come into the league at this year are all wearing it. Yeah. And that's the way they should do it. Um, maybe not next year, but, but yeah, as soon as, as soon as they can, yeah. Um, get it going. No, I, I like yeah. that answer. That's good. Roll it out slowly. That, that does make a lot of sense because, you know, you have to give time for guys that who don't want to, the backlash, implement the first year because every year there's going to be a new class of players coming in in five or six That's years. That's it. Almost everybody's going to have it. When almost everybody has it, then the other guys are probably going to start to wear it. So, no, that makes sense. What do you, what do you think, CP? Think right away or do you think Ted's right? Uh, like, maybe neither. Um, I <laughs> feel like it's like we've had – this isn't something like a helmet where we're constantly seeing it happen. Um, I think, or like a seatbelt where you're going to clean up a lot of people off the road. If, if you don't wear a seatbelt, um, it's, it's a, it was a tragic event. Um, it was a freak I, accident though. Yeah. I think that I just use my own point all... against Ted against me. That was a pretty good CP. <laughs> uh, that wasn't the point I, I was making at all, but you still use it against me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I think that it, a lot of the equipment companies will come out with better technology. It'll be implemented. A lot of the players are already wearing uh, cut protective, like Under Armour or what, what compression stuff. Um, so they're just going to turn it into a turtleneck. I don't think you necessarily have to make it mandatory at all. Um, but we will see a lot of people wear it. The the easier it is. I don't think a lot of players are going to go back to the you know the strap across the neck. Um, if they want to, that's no, totally fine. I wasn't fine, thinking but... that. I was thinking about all the material. You can get gloves today, the cut resistant gloves that you wear. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, and newer. It just comes I just, something like newer. Turtleneck. Yeah. That's all it is. It literally just a turtleneck that comes yeah, up and covers. I, yeah, for sure. I just don't think it's necessarily needs to be mandated at all. Um, but it's, it, I love that it's available and I think that we will see it, a lot more people use it, but I don't want to see the NHL start just bubble wrapping guys for every tragic event that, that happens. Um, but if, if it was, it, it, the problem is that it's such a big thing. It, it's not necessarily like taking a puck to the head where like, you know, there'll be some damage, but you're not probably going to die. Um, that was, that was the thing I was thinking when I made the cages point, like a cage might save you from getting your face cut or your eye poked, but like getting your neck slit and, and, and dying later in hospital or it's not ideal that's what you no, want to avoid completely for sure i yeah i agree with you there i'm just not sure that it's as much a mandatory thing as just we're gonna see a lot more people use them can i be the devil's advocate here and say that when i jumped on ted earlier saying that it sounds like the whole helmet argument it's the same thing here because it sounds to me like back then way back then when helmets were brand new and the very first players started wearing helmets the guys like us right now who are talking about it on the internet, way back then, <laughs> yeah, all the they podcasts were saying, and they yeah. were saying, "Oh well, how often do you see a guy actually have any actual brain damage, or you know, or brought it off from a puck? You know, like goalies go out there, they don't even wear a mask. You know, you want to be a real <laughs> man, like ah, da, 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 da. so I mean, like, our, I just think that I, I, it probably makes sense that it's going to be phased into a protective equipment." Um, because of the simple fact that it's not as much for you as it is for me, right? I, the referee and the coach and the fans don't want to see that, right? It's like the seatbelt. That is where the seatbelt makes sense. Um, you definitely have to have seatbelts because all it happens so often. Um, but it's not the whole, my whole point of the seatbelt was it, the seatbelt's not necessarily for the wearer as much as it is for everybody else too, right? That's sure. why you get a charge if you don't wear one. So, I mean, the thing is with the, the neck guards, I think, probably it makes the most sense i was thinking to be honest like i was thinking this has to be like the whl they did it right like i think they did it right but ted you're on the right case here like you can't just make this thing happen it has to roll out right you have i think to so give it time and maybe if you find 75 percent of the league is doing it and there's studies more studies conducted then maybe you do mandate it because there's only going to be a 25% backlash, and it's like you got to wear a helmet, you got to wear the stupid turtleneck too. Like that's it. It's all. It's a turtleneck. We developed a, the NHL is a billion billion dollar corporation. They can come up with some sort of stupid cut proof turtleneck. Yeah, like we're not. They're not in the business of uh, putting a, uh, that on display, as what happened in that uh, 
that game, that tragic incident. Uh, no one wants to see that happen in any league, on any ice, on, in any sport um, at all, obviously. Um, Rest in peace, the, Adam Johnson, by the way. I'm not yeah. sure we gave him the proper respect. Yeah. No, uh, no one condolences the to the family. Uh, he was the yeah. Oshawa general. Um, he was... Man, uh, yeah. That's It's so tragic. It's... Uh, uh, you know, I don't suggest uh, watching the clip out there for, for trigger warning reasons. Um, but having seen it myself, I know um, crazy uh, yeah. freak accident. Uh, hard to watch and hard to know that that was the outcome of it, obviously. Yeah, it's fucking terrible. Fucking horrible. All right, I got a lot more to talk about, but we're not going to make it through it. Um, Jumbo Joe retired. Love you, Jumbo Joe. We're going to talk about the Senators next time because that's just a shit storm, and there's oh. definitely not going to be over by then. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Yeah, um, more to come. Yeah. On Tuesday. Um, we've spent way too much time here tonight. There's lots to talk about and still lots more, lots going on around the league. Um, thank you for joining us here today on Split the Defense Hockey Podcast. We love you. And we will see you for the next episode. Peace. 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 You've been listening to Split the Defense. Where Jordan Webster, Ted Evans, and Craig Pierce talk about the NHL and all things hockey. Split the Defense. Can be found wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. It's also broadcasted on Amherst Island Radio, 101.3 FM, and online at cjai.ca.